everyone. Delighted to have you here. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and I couldn't be more pleased to welcome you to the Linda N. Cabot Science Symposium entitled From Sea to Changing Sea, a Science Symposium about Oceans. I'm especially pleased to see so many members of the Radcliffe Institute's Dean's Advisory Council here today. I thank them, along with our Radcliffe Associates, and many other faithful friends of the Radcliffe Institute for your support for all that we do. At the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, scholars, scientists, and artists work at the forefront of their fields and across disciplines. We are dedicated to fostering and sharing innovative work with the public in all subjects. But we are especially proud of our strong tradition in the sciences a tradition that manifests itself in this annual science symposium and in the related lecture series that runs throughout the academic year. Science flourishes at Radcliffe because of the many ways it intersects with other disciplines, and we will certainly see those intersections on display here today at our science symposium. We are very grateful for the generosity of Linda Cabot and her husband, Ed Anderson, for their support of today's symposium and also for the way that they embody the Radcliffe mission. Linda Cabot, class of 1980, is the founder and president of an educational organization dedicated to inspiring the next generation of ocean caretakers. She is also a visual artist and a lifelong sailor who brings both of these perspectives to her love of the ocean, just as we here at Radcliffe bring a multidisciplinary approach to many urgent subjects. It is hard to imagine a more urgent subject than oceans. They cover three quarters of our planet and supply 50% of the oxygen we breathe. As Secretary of State John Kerry said last month at a conference on the ocean hosted by the State Department, and I quote him, our ocean is absolutely essential for life itself. Not just the food, but the oxygen and weather cycles of the planet all depend on the ocean. Throughout the world, the sea sculpts the shorelines of our continents and influences the changing climate. Here in New England, the ocean is especially inescapable. The coastline is literally right at our doorstep. So concerns about rising sea levels hit very close to home. Scientists predict that sea levels in Boston could rise anywhere from two to six feet by the end of the century. Our doorsteps, in other words, are the very ones the rising seas are going to flood. But the ocean shapes far more than our landscape here in New England. It undergirds our economy, it shapes our culture, it inspires our urban planning, it influences public health, and much more. So when we say that the ocean has an impact on climate change, we mean the economic and cultural climates as well as the natural one. Let me give you some examples. Cod was once so plentiful off the coast of New England that fishermen joked that they could walk across the Atlantic on the backs of this ubiquitous fish and never get their feet wet. Now, cod populations have collapsed partly because of overfishing, but also because of the rising temperatures of New England's coastal waters. In fact, the cod catch has declined by fully 90% over the past three decades. One of our speakers today will address this critical question. At the same time, warmer waters have led to increases in stocks of shellfish, including lobster. More lobster might sound like good news, until we realize that the sudden increase in supply can make wholesale prices plummet. In 2012, the price paid to lobster and crews fell to $2 per pound, compared to the more typical rate of $4 per pound, and it caused real economic hardship. At one specific place where shifts in the ocean have ripple effects on the local economy and culture is the town of Chatham on Cape Cod site of the Monomoy Wildlife Refuge. Tides, storms, and rising sea levels have redrawn the boundaries of the refuge. 
The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has responded with a wildlife management plan that Chatham Town officials and Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey say will threaten the fishing economy. Meanwhile, after generations of careful stewardship, fishing families perceive the outside restrictions as an attack on local identity. In short, oceans shape our world and our lives in very real ways. If we want to understand the ocean, then we need to look at it from many different perspectives, which is exactly what we are going to do here today. Scholars and experts on subjects ranging from evolutionary biology to oceanography will be sharing the stage with public officials, a Coast Guard officer, and a law professor. Today's conference has been organized by John Huth, the Donner Professor of Science at Harvard and Faculty Director for the Physical Sciences at the Radcliffe Institute. I want to thank John <coughs> uh, for putting together such a probing and fascinating day for us. He is the ideal leader for a Radcliffe conference about oceans because so many of John's professional and personal interests have to do with the water. He is a physicist who has written about the science of navigation from the shores of New England to the Marshall Islands, and he is an expert kayaker who is as comfortable in a boat as he is in a computer lab. So please join me now in welcoming John Huth. Thanks, Liz. So welcome to everybody and good morning. I think we have an exciting program that will be very informative and uh, you'll enjoy it. Uh, so let me just frame my own interest in how I came to set this up. Uh, as part of my uh, ex explorations of how people navigate, I went to the Marshall Islands and uh, went on a voyage with an outrigger canoe between two of the atolls. And we ended up on the island of Tabal, which is on the remote uh, atoll of Aur. And there we were greeted with uh, flower gar garlands and a feast where we had all of these, these fish and breadfruit and lobsters and crabs. And we were, we were welcomed with open arms. In a sense, the, the people who we were coming with and visiting were trying to revive the culture in the Marshall Islands, which is um, under a tremendous amount of stress, um, both from uh, colonial powers, but also from the encroaching oceans as the sea levels rise. And what might have been an abstract thought prior to my visit there, um, became quite visceral how their lives were inextricably linked with the oceans. And this hit home, and what, what I realized when I got back to the States was that we indeed are, our fates are inextricably linked to the oceans, and we've come from the oceans, and we also put a lot of stress on the oceans. So as part of the Radcliffe duties, I suppose, I would hardly call them duties anymore because it's so enjoyable to work here, um, I put together this science symposium on oceans, which gave me something of a hunting license to explore a set of topics that I found to be at the frontiers of science, uh, but also fascinating. And in, in trying to find these speakers that you're here today, um, I realized how incredibly complex the oceans are and, and the diversity of things that you find in the oceans. It's, it's just unbelievable. So I'm, I'm grateful for the speakers uh, that we have today, and, and I welcome you. Uh, I also want to thank Linda Cabot for um, uh, supporting us in this. Um, she's done a fantastic job and provided me with a lot of insight, too, in conservation of the oceans. So I'm grateful for that. So let me invite uh, our first panel today. Uh, it's going to talk about early life and um, interesting life in the ocean. So we have Chris, uh, Peter, and David coming. Uh, you can take your seats now, and I'll just say a few introductory words. So uh, to frame this a little bit, we had a recent talk on the search for life on exoplanets. And the, the speaker talked about looking for signatures of life that more or less are kind of our conventional ideas of what life might be like, um, you know, carbon emitting uh, creatures and certain ratios of gases that we would see. But it was very much tied to a conventional view of, of life as we know it. And people were asking the question, well, what about, what about other forms of life? And, and the speaker said, well, we can't really imagine other forms of life than kind of the conventional sorts of things. And it's difficult to imagine what the origins of life might have been in an earlier epoch in um, our planet. 
But then you start to scratch the surface and you look at people that study different forms of life and you realize that, that there's some amazing forms of life that don't really conform to our, our normal visions of what they might be in the oceans. And so what I tried to do was assemble some speakers that could talk to that. So um, with little further ado, I'm gonna introduce um, Chris Bowler, who uh, we're grateful to have as a Radcliffe Fellow here this year. Um, just kind of spoke up at one of our initial meetings and immediately I was able to start digging up some information and the wheels started turning. He is um, a director of the CRN, CRNS um, Institute for Biology and a uh, professor at uh, Le Col Superior in Paris and uh, works on phytoplanktons and um, amazing to talk to. Chris. Great. Well, thank you, John. Um, it's, it's great to be here. Yes, as, uh, as, as, as John mentioned, I'm, I'm based in Paris uh, normally, but I'm on uh, a sabbatical here at the Radcliffe Institute as a fellow for this year, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to meet uh, many people and to explore new avenues of research and, and, and so on. And it's great to see also that the, uh, that the ocean is, uh, is, uh, is receiving so much interest uh, in the US as it is in Europe. Um, we've had a lot of talks, a lot of discussions about the importance of the ocean, a lot of concern about the ocean uh, in Europe, and it's great to see the same sort of concern uh, over here in, in the USA too. Um, so, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce the first, se the first session, um, which is entitled Early Life in the Oceans, which is uh, a really important topic, obviously, because um, uh, everything that is in the ocean today uh, came from this early life in the ocean, in fact. Everything, all life on Earth, evolved from the ocean uh, uh, three and a half billion or so years ago, so we all evolved from these little organisms which, uh, which started the process of life on, uh, on, on this planet. So it's a fascinating topic. Um, we've got two great speakers here who will uh, uh, introduce their research on the topic. We'll have two talks and then we'll have a discussion time uh, with questions and answers and so on. So please save your questions until the end. Um, and so the, the first speaker is, is David Emerson. Um, who is a um, senior research scientist and associate director for bacteriology in the, uh, the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, which uh, is a very, very well-known institute uh, worldwide and also has a very, very important culture collection of, of microorganisms from, uh, from, from the ocean uh, that is a very, very important resource for, for scientists throughout the world. Um, so thank you for being part of this institute and um, for the work you do, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. So thanks very much, Chris, for that very nice introduction. It's really terrific to be here, uh, to, to be leading off this symposium. I'm really excited to, be ha to have the opportunity to do this. We had a wonderful dinner last night at Dean Cohen's residence. It was... Uh, Really amazing to learn about the Radcliffe, Radcliffe Institution and appreciate everything they do, and especially Linda Cabot for, for um, uh, supporting this symposium. So I'm going to jump right in here. I'm my, I have 20 minutes to talk about three billion years worth of Earth history. So uh, I think the reason that, I, that rust features prominently in my title will become apparent during my talk. Uh, but I want to emphasize my talk will be entirely about the Earth's ocean. Uh, but for that reason, I actually put on my opening slide here a picture of Venus on the left and Mars on the right as the two other rocky planets that we share what's referred to as the habitable <coughs> zone uh, in our solar system, that zone in the solar system where life could exist because there could be liquid water on the surface of a planet. Venus very clearly does not have liquid water on its surface. It's got a 95% CO2 atmosphere, a runaway greenhouse, very much too hot on the surface of Venus to support an ocean. Mars, we believe, probably did have an ocean uh, several billion years ago, uh, but it lost its atmosphere at some point, and now is much too cold to sustain liquid water on the surface. So just to go into a bit of brief Earth history here, I'll start with this first slide, which shows 
the Hadean period, so we're going to start at the formation of the Earth sometime between 4.5 and 4.6 billion years ago. Uh, and this is an artist's rendition of what times would have been like that. Uh, very violent, very hot uh, asteroids, meteorites hitting the planet repeatedly. The moon broke off from the Earth at this time, it's thought. Uh, there would have been times when the entire surface of the planet was essentially a, a, a magma, pool, magma pools. And again, could not have sustained <coughs> a liquid water ocean. Uh, but then you, the, there, this period came to an end somewhere around 4 billion years ago, and we came to what we have today, what we call the blue planet. And this is a, a picture from space, obviously, done by NASA. And I chose this image because it shows the... Uh, the Pacific Ocean primarily, you don't see many land masses, Antarctic is at the bottom there. But this is presumably what the planet could have looked like for the last four billion years from space, was this blue planet that has a sustained ocean. And that's why we're here, right? It's because life could evolve and develop because of this water world. And then as the continents developed, uh, we moved to the continents, obviously. Uh, so <clears throat> the question then becomes, uh, what was this ancient ocean like? And that's uh, the topic I'm gonna address today. And so what can we learn? So we can't learn much by looking at water, right? I mean, the, you take a bucket of ocean water from anywhere, any depth of the ocean or anywhere on the planet, and you really can only get maybe a few thousand years worth of his, Earth history. So, so we, for, from just looking at water, we, we can't get a, a, a history of the Earth, really. And so where can we go to do that? <laughs> Well, one place we can go is to the middle of South Africa. This is a picture of my daughter, Bertinga, and I sitting on a banded iron formation in the Kalahari Desert, hundreds of miles from the ocean. But we know that these, the, this particular ro these rocks were actually formed, were part of the seabed two and a half billion years ago. This is a two and a half billion year old outcrop. And these banded iron formations are very important in terms of telling us what the ancient ocean was like, what life, and, and how life may have come to evolve, develop on Earth. And so banded iron formations have these, uh, this is a, a close-up here of one, and they have these striated appearances where you see these, these very dark red bands, that's hematite, a very iron-rich mineral, uh, interlayered with these chert layers, which are, could be clays, uh, muds that developed. So you see a very distinct pattern here, and as a scientist, that's a very interesting thing, right? Whenever we see a pattern, we think, oh, there must be some sort of cause and effect relationship. <clears throat> Something was going on. There was some kind of cycle, perhaps, going on here that could tell us a lot about what the ancient Earth was like. <clears throat> and so we go to these uh, banded iron formations to, to study these, and these are not small uh, features. This is a picture of an iron mine in Brazil, uh, so banded iron formations can be hundreds or thousands of feet thick. They can cover tens or hundreds of square miles. These were enormous events in Earth history when these, when these iron formations were laid down. And it's also important to point out, this is where we mine, where we get the iron to produce steel. And because these are very highly concentrated ores, steel is very cheap. We can thank modern, I mean, this really for modern civilization in some respects. So this timeline is going to be a central theme of my talk about uh, sort of for the ancient ocean. So we're starting here over on the right side of the x-axis uh, at 1 billion years ago and then going back to 4 billion years in Earth history. And on the top panel here, I'm showing what geologists have found is the major episodes of banded iron or BIF form deposition in Earth history. So these are regions where we've seen a large BIF uh, uh, developments. <clears throat> and this tells us something about the ocean chemistry here in the middle panel, and it also tells us something about what the oxygen levels like, were like on early Earth. And the reason for that is because to get this deposition of these iron deposits, there must have been ferrous iron in the ocean. So ferrous iron is, is soluble. Uh, but it reacts very quickly with oxygen and precipitates as something like a banded iron formation. So in other words, to get these types of uh, uh, formations, there must have been very low oxygen. And we believe those oxygen levels were a fraction of a percent of what we have today in the atmosphere. As we move forward in time, there was what we refer to as this great oxidation event, or at least the surface ocean became oxygenated. That would have reacted with the iron 
precipitated some of it out. Uh, but then, and most of the iron then would have probably been down in the deeper sediments, uh, not so reactive. And then there was also a, a, this also this period, there was a lot of sulfide being developed. Now the ocean is very sulfate rich in our modern ocean. Uh, we have a lot of sulfate in the ocean. And the, the, the chemistry between iron and sulfur is very interesting. You could actually have somebody who is a sulfur geochemist or microbiologist talk and give a similar talk that would use sulfur as a proxy for, for these ancient environments. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to come back to this timeline and use this kind of as a theme for, for talking about how these banded iron formations formed and what that could tell us about the different forms of life. So the first group of, and since I'm a microbiologist, I have a very microbiological slant on this particular topic. Uh, a chemist, there are chemists who have different views that maybe there was more chemistry, abiotic reactions going on. But I'm taking a very microbial-centric view. And the first group of organisms I'm going to talk about are these uh, bacteria that can grow in the absence of oxygen and carry out photosynthesis. It's called anoxygenic photosynthesis. And there's this process here called photoferrotrophy, where these organisms can take light and react with iron to extract chemical energy that they can use, then use to fix carbon dioxide to make cells. And the result of that is, is rust. Iron oxides uh, precipitate out as, as, as a, a rusty material. So this is a culture that was isolated about uh, 25 years ago. And it's growing in light, and it's using iron. Uh, and when you inoculate it, you see the, the, the culture tubes turn rusty. So there's no oxygen in here. If, you had full, if this was just a fully oxygenated tube, that this, the iron that was in here would precipitate, very, it would oxidize very quickly just by itself. But there's no oxygen, so the only way this can happen is by the bacteria catalyzing this reaction. This slide on the right here shows one of these bacteria. The white arrow there points to the bacterial cell, and it's, in, it's uh, encrusted or coated with these iron oxide uh, particulates around it. And one thing you note here, there's one little cell and a lot of iron oxide. And that's a characteristic of any microbe that oxidizes iron. It's actually quite a poor energy source. So you have to oxidize a lot of iron to make a living. So how could this process have worked? Uh, this is a cartoon from a colleague of mine, Ruth Blake at Yale. Uh, and this is a, a role for these photoferrotrophs. Uh, so again, you have a, an ocean, an ancient ocean here, no oxygen. And these organisms growing in the sunlight, oxidizing the iron, which forms these iron oxides. These rain down to the ocean floor uh, and ultimately end up, some of them end up being moved on to the continents and forming those banded iron formations over through, through geological processes. So another important thing to point out, that the point that Ruth was making with this slide, is that not only do you precipitate these iron oxides, but we know that iron oxides are very reactive with a lot of other elements, it's particularly phosphorus. So they can bind a lot of phosphorus, and that's shown here. And what would happen is that iron oxide was raining out of the ocean. It was taking the phosphorus out of the ocean. Now, ph phosphorus is another very important nutrient for all of life. So perhaps as those phosphorus level, as that phosphorus was stripped out of the ocean, that reduced the ability of organisms to grow. And maybe you had cessations in this process, and then the phosphorus gradually built up again uh, and, and allowed the organisms to, to, start, to start working again. That's it's one possibility. That's one possible explanation for these banded bands that we see uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the banded iron formations. So I'm going to come back to the timeline again here now. So I've talked a little bit about these photoferrotrophs, which may have played a, a significant role, certainly in from before the great oxidation event and definitely back in this three and a half billion year time period where we see these banded iron formations, when we know there was virtually no oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, but what about this great oxidation event? What happened here? So what happened here was the cyanobacteria. Uh, and this is an image that my colleague uh, Pete Countway at Bigelow uh, provided to me. This is a picture of a cyanobacteria. And Pete actually did a number of the images that you see of the tiny giants on the wall here. He's a terrific, uh, well, he's a terrific oceanographer as well as microscopist. <coughs> and so this, these organisms grow. This is a colonial uh, type of these organisms. Um, 
and they typically grow as in these these they, they can either grow as single cells or as sort of as these as these micro colonies. And you can see the very green color is due to the chlorophyll that these bacteria have developed. And so these were the this was the evolution of the first uh, oxygenic photosynthesizing organisms. So these were the organisms that we believe really provided the first source of oxygen to the planet. So this was you know, probably the most important evo evolutionary uh, adaptation that we know of. <coughs> so, they, so what these organisms do is they take carbon dioxide and they split water, use, use light energy to split water, and then they again produce their autotrophs, so they make their cell biomass, but the byproduct of this process is oxygen. So at this point, you could have oxygen in the Earth's ocean, start developing. Um, so this picture here is a, is, a, is a cyanobacterial mat in Guerrero Negro in the uh, Baja Peninsula of California. The reason that this is considered sort of a an an potential analog for the early Earth, where you had shallow seas with these mats forming on the, on the ocean floor or the, the sediment. And the reason Guerrero Negro is special is actually quite salty there. It's a near salt works. It's, it's too salty for, for macroorganisms to live, for snails, shrimp, anything that would be grazing, normally grazing on these mats. So there's no grazing here. So these mats can develop in ways that potentially they could have two billion years ago when there were no macroorganisms around. And this is just a close-up of one of these mats. The top layer here is these cyanobacteria producing oxygen, but then below it you have all these other layers, which are a lot of these anoxygenic photosynthetic organisms, those, these purple bacteria that I showed in the earlier slide. So you had very complex communities that were developing. So, so now we have the cyanobacteria uh, that started producing oxygen, and we believe you know, the, the, the current information for the for when life originated on Earth, is, is keeps getting pushed back, and it's now pushed back almost to four billion years. There's chemical evidence for organic molecules that could have been derived from living organisms as long as four billion years ago. We think that the cyanobacteria evolved somewhere between three and 3.5 billion years ago, although may, that may change in the next paper in Science, so you never know. Uh, <coughs> But at any rate, certainly within this period, we believe that there were these cyanobacteria, and so they were starting to provide oxygen and prevent, potentially providing these oases of, of maybe local areas where there was quite a lot of oxygen. And it doesn't, it doesn't show up too well on this slide, but I'm showing these little peaks here where we refer to as whiffs of oxygen could have been in the atmosphere and in the ocean. And so this could have combined with iron and started helping to precipitate these banded iron formations. Uh, but there's also a microbial role here too, and now I'm gonna talk about that now uh, because that's really what I work on, is a group of organisms that can oxidize iron using oxygen and use that, uh, the energy they get from that oxidation to grow. This is an image of a hydrothermal vent. Uh, it's a diffuse flow vent. Uh, it's a Loihi Seamount, about 1,000 meters below the surface. So what we have here is a, a vent fluid coming out with a lot of iron in it flowing over this rock surface. You see all this rusty material here uh, and a little bit of oxygen. Uh, this is an interesting site because it's an oxygen minima zone. So there's only a few micromolar. This is, this is, far, this is about a tenth of a percent of what is in our atmosphere. Uh, so who grows here? So this is an organism called Mary Profundus ferrooxidan, which, which I isolated about 20 years ago, and this was the first iron oxidizing bacteria isolated from the marine environment. A very interesting organism. This is the cell here, and so it, it's oxidizing iron and producing this stock material, which is composed almost entirely of these iron oxides. And so this is the member of a new class of proteobacteria called the zeta proteobacteria. Uh, they're very common in these high iron environments. Uh, hopefully this movie plays, uh, maybe not. Anyway, this was a movie, a time-lapse image of showing this, uh, this bacterium growing, and as it grows, it forms this stalk material and makes this very characteristic helical stalk. So just to show how these organisms work, this is a process we call chemolithoautotrophy. I expect you all to remember that word. So these organisms, again, they, they use they oxidize ferrous iron to this ferric iron, which immediately precipitates as an iron oxide that they produce and produce this stock. 
Uh, they're able to take up CO2, so they're autotrophs. They can also fix nitrogen, so they can pretty much do everything they need to survive. Uh, and so did they play, could they have played a significant role in, in forming these banded iron formations when there was trace amounts of oxygen present? And that's the, one of the questions that we're definitely interested in. And sort of to get, uh, to di dig deeper into that, this is a picture of an intact iron mat that we brought up from the ocean floor. So it's only about a centimeter, half an inch, maybe to an inch thick. Although these mats can, well, I'll show a picture in a minute, but these mats can get much more extensive than that. Um, but the top image here is just the intact mat. Uh, we'll, and then what we've done is sectioned it. And you can see it has this very fibrous appearance. And then as we focus in with more, more and more powerful microscopes, this is a scanning electron micrograph here of one of these sections of this, of this mat. You can see it's all this fibrous material is, is those stalks that were produced by this organism, this very profundus-like organism that I described earlier. So amazing ability to, to do, carry out a lot of iron oxidation. As a microbiologist, we're very interested in the fact these things all grow in the same direction. We're trying to figure out what's up with that. Uh, and there's a whole other, there's whole other groups of, there's a whole village of, of these iron oxidizing bacteria that live in these mats that have various different morphologies, which are very characteristic of biology, right? You can't form these types of structures uh, without biology being present in the presence of these iron oxidizing bacteria. And just to, to bring home the fact, these no, are not necessarily small uh, Lo very localized or very small features on the ocean floor. This is what we call a place we call the Golden Tower, uh, which we found about two, two years ago in the Mariana in the southwestern Pacific. And this is a meter here. We, when we first saw this from the submersible, we thought it was an extinct hydrothermal vent chimney. But when we went up and started really investigating it and poking it, we realized it was constructed almost entirely of these microorganisms. We could stick the, the temperature probe of Jason the submersible right through this thing. We could have driven Jason right through it. We didn't do that, fortunately. But, um, so the point is, is these organisms can form these really interesting biofabrics, these mats-like structures here. And we can see these in the fossil record. Again, because it's a mineral structure, it's quite resilient if it gets preserved in the right way. So this is a 300 million year old hydrothermal vent sample. Uh, and you can see very clearly these distinct uh, sort of helical stalk-like structures in this. Now we're going back on the right picture here, we're going back 1.7 billion years old to, to these filaments, which I also would believe uh, could very well be the remnants of, of ancient iron oxidizing bacteria. So this brings me back to the timeline again. Uh, and so could iron oxidizing bacteria have played, a, these aerobic iron oxidizing bacteria have played a significant role in this banded iron formation? And I would contend certainly at 1.7 billion years old, billion years, we have pretty good evidence that they, they were present and could have played a significant role in, in forming these types of iron formations. Uh, it's harder when you go further back in time to this 2.5 to 3 billion year period here to find really well-preserved rocks. And so one of our goals is, is, is sort of in scientific research is to try to find uh, places where these could, we could find actual preserved evidence for these or other biosignatures that are associated with them. So I am gonna finish up here uh, with a slide of the very modern ocean. This picture was given to me by uh, Kathleen Mitchell, a postdoc at Bigelow, who studies ocean color. And so this is a picture from, I think it was a CWIS NASA satellite uh, going over the Gulf of Maine about three weeks ago. Uh, so here we are in Boston uh, with Bigelow, or right up about here. And I'll just let you contemplate the beauty of uh, what the modern ocean looks like and how fortunate we are to have it. And with that, I will also thank uh, sources of funding for this the, that support my work and a lot of the work that I've described, which of course is the work of a lot of geologists, earth scientists, but the National Science Foundation and NASA are the two major supporters of that work. And a number of colleagues, of course, including Pete Gerges from Harvard, who we collaborate with. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, so we'll move on to the second presentation uh, from uh, Pete Gerges. 
who is Professor of Organismic uh, and Evolutionary Biology here in uh, Harvard. Thanks for coming, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today. And thank you to Liz Cohen and all the organizers uh, and John Huth for uh, the invitation. Uh, this is a fantastic symposium, and I'm just as excited as the rest of you to be here and to see what uh, some of these uh, amazing speakers who are coming up are going to share with us. Uh, Dave and I, as Dave mentioned, were tasked with the job of summarizing um, three billion years of, of life. This is a task I think best left to the gods, for certainly she or he would do better than I. But uh, I will do my best. Uh, and in thinking about uh, what Dave was presenting, who, who we sort of colluded in this effort, decided that I wanted to share with you a, a, a perspective on the evolution of animals in our ocean. And to move from the past uh, up to today with the idea of of giving you a sense of what these animals look like to those of us who consider ourselves physiologists. That is, what do the animals in Earth's past look like? What do the animals uh, in our modern ocean look like? And what does that tell us, uh, what can that tell us about our changing world and how these uh, anthropogenically induced changes uh, may uh, shift the, 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 the kind of diversity we see on our ocean? So I'll start. Uh, with the evolution of animals, right? And, and, and by animals, I mean organisms that have sort of complex shapes. Uh, this is not the same as the evolution of life, which Dave gave you a very nice overview of, but these are the kinds of things that we might look at and recognize as being animals. And I'm gonna start our conversation at about 600 million years ago, during a period in Earth's history where, as Dave mentioned, we started getting these whiffs of oxygen, and we start seeing uh, in the fossil record, evidence for soft-bodied organisms uh, that uh, evolved in this period of time. These early marine animals uh, came in a variety of amazing shapes. And uh, for those of us who think about life in a lower oxygen ocean, as was likely the case 600 million years ago, these shapes likely play a role in conferring function. That is, for an organism that's relatively simple, in terms of its tissues, meaning it doesn't have lungs and gills and all these sort of fancy apparatus to help you know, get gases out of your environment, being uh, thin and having a lot of um, uh, 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 ripples or, or ruffles or things of the sort increases what we call your surface area, right? And it helps them take up uh, the dissolved gases. And you can see that. You can see that in many of the shapes of these organisms that we uh, uh, we, we recover from the fossil record, right? There is a debate as to whether or not we will, uh, that whether or not these organisms are related to today's modern organisms. But for the sake of this presentation and for the sake of our dialogue, I would just point out that in this lower oxygen ocean, uh, we have plenty of animal or animal-like creatures that have shapes that tell us something about how they may have accessed oxygen. Now, a little later on, coral reefs begin, began to appear. And these are the kind of corals that we think of today, these sort of large reef-forming organisms. Uh, believe it or not, they bear a striking resemblance to many of the reefs we see today. And then if you continue moving forward in time, at about 400 million years ago, we start to see the first jawed fishes. This is a fish called a placoderm. It doesn't have scales in the way you think of a fish having scales, but it had the predecessor to scales, that is kind of bony plates that acted as armor for this fish. Now, these and many other organisms have, contributed, have continued to evolve into the diversity of life we see in our ocean today. And so when we, when we go to something like a coral reef, we see echoes of these organisms, whether they were the frilly, uh, uh, sort of invertebrate-like organisms we saw back in the, uh, in the Ediacaran, uh, the, the, the reefs we saw uh, about 500 million years ago, uh, and of course the bony fish that we're all familiar with today. And you can see how evolution has shaped life to occupy a variety of niches or, or habitats uh, from the nearshore environments where we see beautiful communities like, like these uh, sharks and rays, to the darkest depths where I do most of my research, uh, this is an anglerfish, and actually, while we're here, I can't resist. This is too much fun. Um, I want to take a, a, a poll. Um, how many of you think this is a uh, boy? See a show of hands. <laughs> how many of you think it's a girl? 
Oh, I love this. It's a well-informed audience. Uh, this is a girl. Uh, her, her mate is probably attached back here. Um, men hang on, they bite on to females and they eventually degenerate into little more than a pair of reproductive organs and um, some semblance of fins and that's it. So on my lazy days, this actually sounds pretty appealing, but that's, we'll, we'll move on. <clears throat> there, um, we, we've seen uh, uh, communities of, evolve around these undersea volcanoes uh, that uh, are, are occupy our, uh, our Earth's um, ocean ridge system. This is some 60,000 kilometers of a mountain range that's peppered with volcanoes, and you should know 90% of the volcanic activity on Earth takes place in the ocean. Uh, and uh, many unique organisms have around here, evolved around these sites. I'll tell you about some of them in a few minutes. But again, in the interest of, of sharing some of the wonder that we uh, scientists experience when we study the ocean, I wanted to show two short videos. Uh, this uh, is... Uh, Oh, well, you'll see what this is, but it certainly quickened the beating of my heart. This is an underwater autonomous vehicle, uh, called a Remus, being attacked by a great white shark. Or, let's be clear here, being um, interrogated by a great white shark. This is the way they understand their world, right? So, uh, um, this, uh, for uh, your information, is on exhibit at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Museum uh, down in uh, Woods Hole, if you want to go see it. <clears throat> Many of these other organisms captive our, uh, captivate our imagination in other ways. I'm fortunate to uh, be working closely with the Ocean Exploration Trust. This is founded by Bob Ballard, uh, and it's an institute uh, solely dedicated to exploration and outreach and engaging the public in ocean science. Um, what you would hear is a bunch of scientists uh, screaming and yelling uh, uh, about what you're about to see. Uh, as we dive in our ocean, we come across things we don't expect. In this case, a sperm whale, uh, a young sperm whale checking out the remotely operated submarine. Can you see it there? It's just swimming underneath. And the scientists went just berserk. Uh, and this, by the way, is broadcast live in real time. So if any of you are interested, you can look up Nautilus Live and you'll be able to join us on our expeditions. But check this out. This sperm whale is just as interested in us as we are in it. And you can see its mouth and its fin and that's its, its belly as it swims by. Now, these um, charismatic macrofauna, or megafauna as we call them, always capture our imaginations, but it's important to remember that the ocean, today's ocean, also harbors a lot of microbes. There are about 10 to the 27th microbes in our ocean, and if each of them is a micron in length, and you place them end on end, they would extend 10 to the 21st meters. This is 105,000 light years. So that would stretch the Milky Way. That would span our galaxy in microbes, right? And so that is a, a very excellent reminder that just because they are small doesn't mean they're unimportant. And in fact, the uh, microbes in our world run our planet, and without them, our biosphere would come to a halt. And so, <clears throat> in fact, sometimes it's easy to forget that, um, here, this, I'll start here, that, it's, uh, that the ocean alone represents about 85% of our planet's habitable space. And so that is every other environment you think of, from the desert to the tundra to the upper half, kilometer, uh, half mile of ocean, all of that fits in the other 15%. So 85% of our planet's biosphere is deep ocean. That's perpetually dark and perpetually cold, right? And so while we tend to think of that as the extreme environment, arguably, we're the ones who live in the extreme environment. And if you took this map and used the surface area to represent the habitable space, it really should look something like that. But our knowledge of our oceans and its denizens really is still in its infancy. There's about two million known animal species. Estimates of, from the Census of Marine Life suggest there's likely 18 million more species we have not discovered. Um, if you are brave enough to include microbes and try to actually figure out what a microbial species even is, that puts you up at near a trillion. Uh, and again, these microbes run our planet, they run our biosphere, and without them, uh, we wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to live, um, yet we only ha we have less than a percent of them in culture, right? So we have a daunting task ahead of us. And our ignorance about the ocean, if I can call it that, is based in part on its inaccessibility, right? It's a world that's very different than ours. As I mentioned, on average, sea the, the seawater temperatures are near freezing, because once you get into the deep sea, it's chronically cold, it's chronically dark, and this has an influence on, on the evolution of life uh, in that environment. Uh, and in this chronically cold, chronically dark world, pressures increase as you go deeper. 
And when you're at the Mariana Trench, you're talking about 14,000 PSI. Those of you who fill your car tires dutifully, top them off to about 35 PSI, right? So think about 14,000. Uh, this is about the weight of 50 jumbo jets on any person in this room, right? And yet, life exists there and does just fine. But the ocean is a hostile work environment for us, right? That's what makes it challenging. And so these organisms thrive in our ocean through, a, through what I would call a, a range of evolutionary adaptations. And that's really what I want to focus on uh, in uh, the remaining time here, is to give you a sense of what those are and why it is that we see the kinds of diversity that we see. All right, so this is a glimpse into our ocean through the eyes of a physiologist. But our ocean really isn't one homogenous you know, bucket of soup. Uh, it is, an, uh, uh, it is a, uh, an environment that has many habitats within it. And starting from the upper ocean, uh, which is well lit by sunlight in a very dynamic and exciting place, uh, to, uh, to as you go deeper and deeper uh, and you find fewer and fewer organisms, equally interesting, equally important, fewer in number, but incredible in diversity, meaning we find organisms uh, that we don't find anywhere else on Earth and in, num in great numbers. So the upper ocean, uh, or what we call the euphotic zone, is what most people think about when I say ocean. Right? It's, it's a, a part of our ocean that, from a physiologist's perspective, is very energy rich. There's plenty of sunlight. This leads to the growth of algae and diatoms and other organisms that are the primary producers of our planet. They're the ones who feed um, the, the, the rest of, 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 of the animals. And so it's that availability of energy that allows organisms to be very active uh, and um, provides them with energy to cope with the, temporal, the temperature changes that, uh, that occur over day and night, uh, changes that occur seasonally and the like. But as you go deeper into the ocean, the conditions become more constant and more stable. That is, you don't see the kinds of temperature or chemical oscillations that you do. Uh, and as a consequence of this stability, not only in space, but frankly over evolutionary time, we see this incredible um, diversity of organisms arise in the midwater. Uh, for example, this is a, a, a creature called Phronema. Does anybody recognize this? Cu couple of fans here, yeah. Those of you who are fans of the Aliens movies, this was the inspiration, no joke, for the, um, uh, for the uh, creature in the Aliens movie. And perhaps the artist knew that this creature makes a living by killing jellyfish called salps. Uh, it kills the barrel-shaped ones. Uh, and crawls inside their body and lives there. That's what it does. Um, this is a, a fish called the barrel eye spook fish. Uh, anybody want to tell me what this is? It's, its mouth. What are those? Nope, that's its nose. Those are its eyes. It has a translucent or transparent head and two large eyes that rotate inside its skull that allow it to look upwards and then forward. So really, really wild critter. As we go deeper and deeper into the ocean, we start to see uh, similarly wild organisms. Uh, we, we start to see things happening that we still don't understand. For reasons that are unclear, some organisms in the deep sea grow to an incredibly large size, like this amphipod, or a, a little beach hopper. Um, and so you, their um, cousins, if you will, on the beach are about this big, and they probably irritate you when you're sitting there on the beach. In the bottom of the Mariana Trench, uh, this is how big they get. We see sea cucumbers that have evolved to swim. Uh, the snailfish that is a new species. And there are parts of our ocean, in fact, that have always had, or rather, that have low oxygen uh, over time. They're, they're sort of chronically low in oxygen, so-called oxygen minimum zones. And these are very interesting because as we start to see uh, changes to our climate, we start to see some of these expanding. But I want to talk to you about some of the denizens of this zone, and I'll come back to why they're important later. Um, but uh, this is an area with very little oxygen, uh, and yet we see a, a diversity of organisms that have evolved to cope with that low oxygen. Uh, we see these large uh, sponges that we see on the seafloor. The, uh, the famous vampire squid uh, has a, um, blood bind, a, a blood protein that binds oxygen with incredibly high affinity. That means it, when it comes into contact with a little bit of oxygen in seawater, it can pull it out and provide it to the animal. Same with this uh, organism called Nathophausia, which is a kind of mycid shrimp. Organisms in the deep, uh, when we get to the soft bottom sediments, many of them have similar adaptations to low oxygen. Uh, we see that a lot of them have symbionts that can help them cope with sulfide that Dave mentioned that may be produced in sediments. 
Um, there are also some really neat morphological adaptations like this C pen here that uh, puts its stock in the sediment, uh, puts its fronds upwards to get oxygen and to filter feed food. And this is just one of my favorite, I just have to show you. It's a tripod fish. Uh, it's, it, the pectoral uh, fins have turned into stands, so it's like a little camera tripod. Uh, and it, sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, fins, and its pectoral fins actually are like two big baskets, and it puts its face into the current, and, and it grabs food as it comes by. So, but I have a soft spot in my heart for the hydrothermal vents. These are the most extreme environments on our planet without question. Because of the pressure found in the deep ocean, the water does not boil. And as a consequence, the water temperature can reach 450 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than your oven in self-clean mode. And yet, we see a tremendous amount of life living around the vents, not in the 400 degree waters. They actually live in the sort of bathtub kind of temperature waters that you see. But um, this is a tremendous amount of life that's based on, on chemical energy. The microbes that live at vents will do, pro carry out processes similar to what Dave shared with you. But instead of uh, just being iron, many of them are oxidizing compounds like hydrogen sulfide, that rotten egg smell that comes out of sewer. Or they're getting energy from methane. And we all know there's plenty of energy in methane if you've ever used a gas grill or, or a barbecue, right? So these microbes have evolved the capacity to harness energy from these chemicals and feed themselves and their host. And so vents are tremendously diverse and harbor animals that are some of the most tolerant on Earth, including these worms that are the most thermotolerant animals that we know of. They can withstand the highest temperatures chronically of about, about 55 degrees Celsius or 120-ish or so Fahrenheit. Now, all these marine animals have evolved morphological, physiological, and biochemical capacities that enable them to thrive in their particular environment. This is true whether we're talking 600 million years ago or today. And that includes variations in oxygen or carbon dioxide or temperature or pH, many of the things that we're worried about in our changing world. Organ there are marine organisms that have evolved naturally to cope with those. Uh, you can see that some of these marine organisms from the Ediacaran look a lot like the sea pens we have today, right? That, uh, again, have these very frilly body plans to help them take up oxygen and to feed. We know that some animals have evolved unique features in their, in their guts to host certain kinds of microbes. In fact, this is a study that I worked on with Dave Emerson looking at the gut microbes of, of the North Atlantic right whale to understand how they get their nutrition. Uh, and there are many other biochemical uh, attributes that have evolved, like these tube worms at the vents. They have a hemoglobin, actually surprisingly similar to yours and mine, that can bind oxygen and bind sulfide. Even even the muscles that you would enjoy in a nice chipino, they are very tolerant to environmental changes because of where they live. They can cope with changes in temperature and pH and the like. So basically, look, our oceans have and will continue to evolve, right? This will continue to happen whether we want it to or not. And they'll continue to evolve in response. I love this comic. I should have just ended here. But, um, but they'll continue to evolve uh, whether you talk about oxygen, temperature, pH, and, and the like. But here's the punchline. As we think about the evolution of animals uh, f over the last 600 million years, it's important to remember the rate of change. And most organisms today are really not well poised to respond to the, the, the rapid pace of change in our environment. And so the question in some ways is, uh, is that we know that humankind is always going to have an impact on our ocean, right? Uh, the question is really not are we going to kill all ocean life, because short of you know, complete nuclear holocaust, our activities are not likely to bring our ocean to a halt. But the question is, what kind of an ocean will we create? And so when we think about the diversity of organisms that exist in our ocean, bear in mind that as we, carry out, as we uh, see these changes occurring, we will start to see things like the increase in lobsters that was mentioned earlier, uh, and changes in our midwater and deep ocean community. Uh, and we, we are, have to recognize that those changes come with an intrinsic and an extrinsic loss, meaning that we're going to lose natural biodiversity, but we may also impact um, species that are important to our own well-being. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time uh, and appreciate your attention. Well, thank you very much. Is that? Yeah, that's working. So that's uh, been a great introduction to, uh, to the day. Um,
uh, as you see, uh, we've, we've been uh, looking at early life, really the early life um, uh, uh, from three, three and a half billion years ago uh, from, from Dave. Um, and we've been looking at uh, the, the evolution of animals in particular uh, from 500 million years or so ago from, 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 Pete, from Pete. So thank you for those two uh, great presentations. Uh, but we do have a gap in between, right? So between three billion years ago and 500, billion, 500 million years ago, we've got about two and a half uh, uh, billion years. Um, uh, presumably things happened during that time. So perhaps uh, uh, the two of you would like to uh, uh, mention a, f a few things about what we know about how life evolved uh, during that, that time um, and, uh, and, and how sort of the, the evolution of, photo of oxygenic photosynthesis uh, three billion years ago uh, ultimately permitted the evolution of animal life 500 million years ago. I think you're the right person for the job, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Want to give it a go? Do you, do you want me to start? Yeah, by all means. Yeah, yeah well, literally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the expert's right here. <laughs> that was not my intention. Well, <laughs> you're, you're up here. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't prepare an answer. I just prepared the question. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so certain, certainly one thing, uh, we, we, we know that uh, uh, oxygenic photosynthesis uh, uh, um, evolved as we saw this morning. Um, and that subsequent to that, um, respiration sort of evolved. Now, respiration is sort of photosynthesis in, re in reverse. Um, so rather than uh, 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 consuming CO2 and generating oxygen, respiration is uh, consuming oxygen and generating CO2. So this, this, this happened at some point, and then subsequent to that, uh, there was the evolution of the eukaryotes. Um, what, what Dave talked about with the prokaryotes, the, uh, the primitive uh, bacteria uh, and archaea organisms. Um, subsequently to those, we had the eukaryotes, which are cells, m more complex cells, the sorts of cells that we have, mm -hmm. where we have uh, uh, respiration happening inside mitochondria, which used to be bacteria that we, that we, uh, that we acquired. And uh, the photosynthetic organisms took the, uh, the, the cyanobacteria inside the cells and generated the chloroplasts, which, which power photosynthesis now. So we had the evolution of the eukaryotic uh, organisms, mm -hmm. uh, unicellular still, right? Um, yeah. And then, uh, um, uh, I, I don't really know too much more. There was maybe the, the evolution of some fairly primitive uh, multicellular life forms, yeah. um, not very complex, not very well developed, yeah. which then subsequently gave birth to this, this incredible explosion of multicellular life in the Cambrian. So yeah. I well, wonder how that happened. I think, I, think um, I had the privilege of teaching a, a course a couple of years ago with Andy Knoll. And one of the things that we really tried to do is, is step away from uh, concerning ourselves about the particular organisms that evolved over time. And, and focus on this sort of fundamental question. And I think, you know, Chris, you set this up really well in that as, as we think about the evolution of life and the evolution of the eukaryotes, well, actually, let's go back to respiration. Um, once we start to see uh, the evolution of eukaryotes that have in them what was likely uh, a bacteria, right, uh, that now came inside another cell and you have a cell with this this, this mitochondria, which are your power plants in your body, um, you have an organism that's carrying out aerobic respiration. And from the physiologist's point of view, one thing that's neat to think about is how much energy you get uh, from different substrates that you might use, right? And so Dave talked a lot about iron oxidizers, and if you start looking at the energy yields you can get from taking uh, uh, oxidizing iron with oxygen or nitrate or something else, you know, you get a certain amount of energy uh, per mole. Or think of it as like, how much energy do you get from eating a dozen eggs versus a, a dozen celery sticks, right? The, the eggs are gonna have a lot more energy per unit. And when we think about energy metabolism, r respiration is an incredible way to get a lot of energy 
per unit substrate. And this opens up a lot of possibilities. And it's, I would argue, one of the factors why we see the evolution of multicellularity. The punchline, in a way, comes down to this, that all of the diversity of animal life you see on Earth is based to a lesser extent on the differences in energy metabolism, because how you make your energy is frankly not that different than a goldfish or a, or a leopard or a snake or a lizard, right? All of, all of those organisms, we all eat organic matter. Uh, I don't mean whole foods, I mean organic matter, right? <laughs> and we breathe oxygen, and that's how we generate our energy, and that's it. You can hold your breath and do some amount of work for some time, but that's it. Microbes have this tremendous physiological diversity. They can, some of them, you know, seem to get energy from oxidizing uranium. I mean, it's out of control what microbes do. But we organisms, we get our energy by eating things, and it's led to this tremendous diversity of morphological adaptations. We see all these kinds of, of multicellular life having very different shapes and different forms that capitalizes on their environment. And so I think that isn't necessarily what happened over that period of time, but once you get respiration mm -hmm. and you start to get eukaryotes, you do start to see this diversification of multicellularity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah. So maybe I could just add a little genetic okay. touch to that. I mean, yes, it's, it's, um, that I, you know, so the microbes that Pete talked about as being you know, the, the incredible abundance, well, that genetic diversity is also incredibly abundant, and, yeah. and all of our genes are yeah. somehow derived from a, a, a microbial ancestor, and the genes for using oxygen. Pete and I are looking at trying to, one of the things we're interested in is trying to measure how low a microbe can go in terms of its ability to respire on oxygen. Mm -hmm. But it was the development of those processes and that genetic uh, adaptations that ultimately led to, to to multicellular life, yeah. and I think that's a great question, is how you, <laughs> can we see the, those, those ancestral uh, gene exchange events even, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to, to try to, to track that mm -hmm. process. We'll, we'll, we'll perhaps take some, take some questions from the floor, so if you want to uh, go to the mic and start, start lining up, and maybe while you get organized, I'll perhaps ask another quick question for, from, for the two of you. Um, you, you did talk about, in particular, Dave, you talked about uh, um, the generation of oxygen and how that has uh, influenced the, the, the Earth. Um, you, but neither of you talked too much about climate and the, in, the, 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 the connection between life on our planet and changes in climate. And so these organisms, they, they manip in addition to generating oxygen, they also manipulate carbon dioxide yeah. and methane, which we know are greenhouse gases. So mm -hmm. What evidence do we have that, that life has actually changed our climate over time? If you can maybe answer quickly and then. Sure. Dave, you want to give it a shot? Uh, well, sure. I mean, certainly methane, obviously, is a, is a microbial process. Most of the methane that we see in, 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 in natural iron seeps is, is coming from methanogens. That was presumably a very ancient group of organisms that, I mean, they're very oxygen sensitive, so they die in the presence of any oxygen. Uh, so that development of, of methanogenesis and the methane production uh, was certainly, I mean, that might alone as well as, well, and, and then also CO2 fixation, which we also didn't talk about. The other major innovation besides photosynthesis was the development of Rubisco, the enzyme that actually fixes carbon dioxide and makes all the biomass that we have. Uh, incredibly important in terms of, of influencing the, the atmosphere. And sort of two, two quick, very quick thoughts. So one is um, we should not assume that our world is an aerobic world alone, right? There are plenty of anaerobic environments in our world. And as Dave said, we know, we know uh, we're, we're very interested in the role that microbes play in methane cycling. But there are also big questions about the role they play in, in carbon cycling and just what's the fate of carbon that gets buried and, and, and the like. And, and um, I know Ann Pearson, Professor Ann Pearson's in the audience, and her lab studies quite a bit of that. So it's, a, it's really vastly complicated. I guess that's a good Great. way to end. <laughs> okay, so please go ahead if you uh, introduce yourself and then ask your question, please. Um, my name is Adam Sachs. I'm with an organization called Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. And I have a question for Dr. Emerson. Um, on your first two slides, at four and a half billion years ago, we had a very hot and inhospitable place. And on a given date, 
say June 4th, because that's my birthday, in advance of my birthday, in the year 4 billion <laughs> BCE, the Earth suddenly turned blue. Where did that water come from? Ah, a great question. So I looked into this a little bit because it's uh, 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 obviously, so I, and, and of course this didn't happen just on your birthday, <laughs> <laughs> unless you're a few hundred million years old. Um, but where the water came from, so we believe a lot of it came from asteroids and, and meteorites hitting the Earth, but there's also accumulating evidence that a lot of it just came from sort of rock reactions, condensation of, of as the planet condensed to become a hard rocky planet that water was released from those reactions too. So it's estimated, I mean, people study isotope ratios and get into some very detailed geochemistry, which I don't entirely understand, I must admit. But it's, a, but it's an interesting question, actually, as to where that water came from. And it's a lot of water. And it's a lot of water. Yeah. Yeah. But you know that the moon of, of, of uh, Enceladus, or, or Europa, the moon of uh, Jupiter, has an ocean that's twice the volume of the Earth's ocean? Yep but it's under 20 kilometers of ice. So think about that. <laughs> yeah. OK, next question, please. Uh, David Jackson, uh, Radcliffe Institute. Um, as uh, Dr. Emerson was uh, alluding to, uh, genetic uh, processes are very important in uh, the evolution of uh, oceans and the things that they live in them. I wonder if you could say something about the role of viruses, of which more and more are being discovered uh, daily in the oceans, both as agents for genetic exchange uh, and as natural selective agents in, the, on their own, in their own right. Take that one, Peter. Uh, you, sh you showed the, the, the picture of the mi micro strung. And, and <laughs> how far do the viruses go? Yeah, exactly. That's, a, yeah, that's probably another astronomical number. Um, so there's a, uh, uh, just to provide a, a, a bit of context, so uh, viruses can uh, play a role in moving genes from one organism to another. And one of the challenges we have in thinking about microbes is that there seems to be a degree of promiscuity among microbes in their genes. That is, we see genes from one microbe and another microbe. This is also true in animals, where we start to see genes in animals and microbes and, and you know, vice versa. Um, and so I think it is uh, absolutely uh, fair to say that uh, our ongoing, our community's ongoing studies of viruses or the so-called virome is gonna show that they play a tremendous role in the evolution of microbes on Earth and animals as well. And so this is gonna, to, uh, to me, really challenges our, our um, notion of the species concept, which is robust in the absence of that. But then, you know, if I find out, if we find out, for example, that you, sir, are 3% algae, I mean, I'm being ridiculous, right? But I, it, then what does that mean? And so, um, a lot of work is being put into studying viruses, not only in the, in the um, open ocean, but actually in the deep subsurface biosphere as well, where uh, we know that there are tremendous communities of microbes and are trying to understand the role of viruses in mediating exchange. Now just one quick addition to that. I mean, it's estimated by my <laughs> colleagues at Bigelow, some of who are virologists, that basically all these phytoplankton you see on the walls here could be that they could turn over almost every day just due to viral lysis as well. Oh yeah, so right. Just right. incredibly important process in terms of the carbon cycle in the ocean. Yeah. So don't think of viruses as just nasty disease causing things, but more like lubricants mm -hmm. in the ocean, making go. sure that the ecosystem is turning over and gene flow and yeah. Uh, yeah, things are absolutely. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Next question, please. I am Prudence Steiner on the Radcliffe Institute board, I have perhaps the most naive question of all, and that is how do you define life? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I'm not thinking theologically. <laughs> One of those naive let's, questions. Let's, are dump always on, let's dump it on Chris again. <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Vi viruses are not considered to be living organisms, for example. So, so in our definition of life, viruses are not in there. So, so then, what is? Uh, they're not in there because they are not self-replicating, right? They need other things to 
to replicate. So, yeah, once you cross that border that a virus isn't life, then 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 where do you go? Um, it's it, it's hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> You have to be able to generate energy. You have to be able to reproduce, replicate. Um, I'd say those are, and I was just at a NASA workshop where we were discussing some of these issues, and, and one of the issues that came up is being able to move, being modal, being able to move is, is another potential uh, very important thing for life because you can move around and to, to, to move, you can, eat in one spot, and, but if you can't move somewhere else, then you consume all your resources, and so. And then, yet, of course, we know there are organisms that don't move. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. And I, this is of great interest to the astrobiology community because if we start looking for life on, on um, other planetary bodies, the question is, do you look for things like DNA? Well, it may, you might not find the same core molecules, right? And there may be other metrics we need to put into place. My name is Davidson Rubin, a student at Harvard. Um, I'm curious as to, uh, this is directed at Professor uh, uh, Peter uh, Gerges. Um, given, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm not as courageous as the previous uh, questioner to ask <laughs> question. Anyway, um, given that um, there's not been as much research as we've explored in other fields such as uh, space and, and uh, terrestrial planes, what, what does the data give so far as to what our our oceans might become, uh, as we previously seen that it's not going to be eradicated. You know, it's not going to be annihilated. So, would it more favor uh, aerobic uh, organisms or or anaerobic organisms uh, grow in multitude? What would be the effects that we see from the current data? Thank you. Uh, so, um, Davidson's a student in my class, by the way. So this is definitely <laughs> extra credit point. Uh, no, so to. Um, <laughs> So, so in the interest of time, Davidson, I'll, I'll keep it simple and say that I suspect our speakers this afternoon are going to touch upon a lot of that, so we'll let them do the heavy lifting. But I think it's more than just a, a, a simple idea of, oh, the temperature might change or oxygen might be less, because those all have subsequent consequences. If, we if temperature changes uh, enough and we disrupt the kind of global ocean circulation, that has huge impl implications for the distribution of oxygen and other components. So it's it's... I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to our speakers this afternoon, but there are, that's the tough part. There is no crystal ball that we can look into that says, oh, it's as simple as this. We, we really don't know, in my opinion. Okay, right, if there's no more questions, then uh, thanks for your interest, and, and thanks to a great uh, starting session. Thank you.